What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my build for the Scald class in Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. So just a couple quick notes at the beginning of the video here. Compared to the previous builds that I've made for the game, this one is a bit more complicated in the sense that there's a bunch of toggles and you really need to have a solid understanding of the combat in order to use it effectively. And to that end, while this is definitely capable of working on unfair difficulty, like pretty much any build, that's really only if you have a solid understanding of the system and where to find certain things, etc. Now the premise of this build is to use the Demon Dancer archetype from the Scald class in order to simultaneously maximize our unarmed damage through the use of the Demon Dancer's buffs to your natural attacks, which is things like unarmed damage, capitalize on their Inspired Rage ability, which is a sort of combination between the Bard Song and barbarian rage abilities, as well as taking advantage of the bard spell list, which we'll get access to. So before we even go too far in this, it's important to understand that inspired rage will affect your entire group, and it will affect certain classes' ability to do things like do anything that requires concentration. And as such, if you are going to use this as your main character, which is highly what I would recommend, then you're going to want to turn off the accept rage ability for all of your non-melee classes, so basically all of your casters, should not be accepting the rage from this class. And because of a few of the Demon Dancer's abilities, when it comes to playing with certain companions, I would very much so recommend that you play with a mostly either neutral or evil party, because one of the Demon Dancer's abilities will cause damage to good aligned characters, which can cause you some problems if you're running with a good party. So this build definitely works best for evil characters, and specifically evil aligned parties as much as possible because while you won't be doing a ton of damage to your good aligned companions still anything more than zero is obviously a bit of a problem so some of the really cool abilities that we get as a scald are for starters our inspired rage now this is basically barbarian rage but we get smaller bonuses and they affect our entire party or whoever is accepting the rage effect now we will get a couple of other things that we can use instead of inspired rage that are similar to bard song but it's important to understand that they are exclusive with Inspired Rage. So things like Song of Strength, Dirge of Doom, and the Song of the Fallen that we'll get, we can use them, but it's important to, again, understand that they will not work at the same time Inspired Rage is working. But that said, Inspired Rage is the big one that we need anyway, and the rest of them are more situational. And then the Scald will actually pick up two Barbarian Rage powers just as class features, and those are the Fiend Totem and the Fiend Totem Greater. So Fiend Totem Greater is what's going to cause you to not want to use good aligned creatures, because while you're raging, Good aligned creatures will take two die six points of slashing damage every time the barbarian's turn rolls around. And then regular fiend totem causes anyone striking the barbarian in melee range to take one die six points of piercing damage. And then we have demonic conquest. So at level seven for our scald, we'll be able to increase the strength bonuses from our Inspire Rage to two. However, if the creatures stop attacking or change target, they suffer one die six plus your Scald level points of damage. This is another reason why we don't want to have the Rage effect affecting our casters, but for your melee characters, this really shouldn't be that bad. And then starting at level three, but increasing at seventh, twelfth, and seventeenth level, we get a bite attack while we are inspired by our Rage. And in fact, everyone who accepts this Rage gets this bite attack, but primarily we're concerned about ourselves with this one. And this will give us a bite attack dealing increasing damage as we hit the earlier levels. So those are the main things to keep in mind. And here's the part that I personally don't do very often. In fact, I specifically go out of my way not to do this in most cases. But levels 19 and 20 for your Scald are really not that great, especially as a Demon Dancer. So while you will start with level 1 in Scald, what I would actually recommend for level 2 and 3 is a Scaled Fist Monk. This is a very common dip, and I find it annoying that it is in most builds. However, what most people take this dip for is the AC bonuses. However, for this particular build, what we're actually using it for is the extra unarmed damage and attacks. Now, we are going to pick up the AC stuff because it's just very good and why not? The primary reason we're taking these levels is to get the extra unarmed bonuses that these two levels in Monk will give us. But to start at character creation, and then work our way there. Race, I personally like to play this as an Angelkin ASMR because this is going to give us a racial bonus to strength and charisma, which is what we actually need anyway. For our background, if you don't want to take the monk dip and you just choose not to do that, then I would recommend Martial Disciple. However, if you do take the monk dip, 
then I would go with Mendevian Orphan, which gives us some appropriate bonuses as well. For our stats, this is one of those things where everyone likes to disagree, but if you want to take Strength and Charisma to 18 combined with your racial bonus, you'll still have a few points left over to put in like Dex or Constitution. But personally, after playing around with this build a bit, I liked... 18 in Strength, 18 in Charisma, and 14 in Dex, but there are a few different ways you can spread this. The Charisma is primarily going to affect things like uh, how many rounds per day you can Rage, etc. And Strength is pretty much where all of our damage and our attack rolls are coming from, so we're going to want as much Strength as we can get as well. And then Dex just gives us extra AC because we're not going to be wearing any armor to take advantage of the Monk Dip. And then for Skills, me personally, I like to go Athletics, Lore Religion, and Persuasion, as we'll get a bunch of bonuses to those. We do get a bunch of bonuses to use magic device as well but we won't really be doing that a lot as this class but you can pick that up if you wanted and then for our level one feat i would actually recommend lingering performance because if you're unaware with bard songs they activate when you turn them on and around and then lingering performance will cause them to last two rounds after they end so if you abuse this a little bit and then activate a bard song and then immediately turn it off which will cost you one round use of it lingering performance will actually turn that one round into three rounds which you can kind of then repeat essentially using one feet to triple the length of your performances but you don't necessarily need to take that and if you don't want to take it i'd recommend blind fight for a level one feat instead and then you're also going to get a bonus feat at level one as a scald which i recommend being spell focus conjuration not so much because we're going to use this much but because it is a prerequisite to a few other things that we're going to want Want later. So that's kind of how to start building your character. And then from there, let's talk about leveling up and the other feats to take. So first and foremost, levels two and three are going to be your monk dip. So let's go ahead and talk about those real quick. So level one monk, which will be level two for us overall, we're going to pick up the monk, of course, and then pick up crane style for your monk bonus feat. This gives you an extra dodge bonus while fighting defensively, but at a penalty to your attack rolls. And then for our third level, you're going to want to pick up dodge, which will give you just just a flat plus one dodge bonus to your AC, but is also a prerequisite to some feats we're going to use later. Now, it's important that you become a scaled fist monk because this is going to change the wisdom stuff to charisma, which is what we're actually using. That's why it's important to pick up scaled fist because this will cause our charisma modifier to just be added to our AC when we're not encumbered or wearing armor. And then monks themselves get a bunch of extra bonuses to unarmed damage, which we're going to be doing a lot of with this unarmed build. Now, before we jump into our regular feats, for our scald talents, which are extra combat feats we get to pick up as a scald, for our level two feat, we're going to pick up weapon focus, which is just going to give us a plus one to our attack rolls and things with our unarmed attacks because we're going to choose unarmed when we pick that. And then for level 7, I'd like to pick up Hammer the Gap. So we're going to be making quite a few unarmed attacks later on, especially like 8 or 9 attacks per round even. When we make a full attack, this will cause our subsequent hits to do more damage per the number of consecutive hits. So we'll get a ton of extra damage out of Hammer the Gap here. And then at 12, I like to pick up Critical Focus. This will just make it more likely to confirm critical hits when you roll in that 20. And then at level 17, I personally like to pick up Sickening Critical with this, though honestly you could change that to whatever. We will actually get to pick a few of our rage powers late game. So the Demon Dancer has the first few picked for them that they can't change, but at levels 12, 15, and 18, we do get to pick a few of them. So for the first one, we want to pick up Fiend Totem Lesser. This is going to give us a gore attack, and because we are not using weapons, it is a primary attack, which will be made at our full attack bonus. But it's important to understand that this will only be in effect while we are raging. And then at 15, we can pick up Animal Fury, which will give us a bite attack when made as part of a full attack, which it should be. The bite attack will be made at our full attack bonus. Now again, this is while we are raging. And then at 18, I like to pick up Lethal Stance myself, which will give us a bit of a extra bonus on our melee attack rolls. However, you can honestly pick up something else if you don't like Lethal Stance, but it's the one I like to use. All right, so now let's talk about the regular feats. Uh, again, at level one, if you picked up Lingering Performance, then I would pick up Blind Fight at level three. Then at level five, we're going to pick up Augment Summoning. So this is because while we're leveling up and we're picking up our Bard spells, the two primary sources of spells that you want to focus on 
are summon elementals and summon monsters. Beyond that, when it comes to using your bard spells, you're just going to pick up buff spells, and we can use augment summoning to just make our summons stronger, which is super effective, especially on later difficulties, where having bodies for enemies to hit that are not you is especially helpful. And then at level 7, we can finally pick up Crane Wing. Now, if we were an actual monk, we could have picked this up earlier. However, because we only have two levels in monk, the base attack bonus requirement is what we have to use for Crane Wing instead of the monk level requirement which is why we can finally pick it up at level 7. As long as we have our hands free, we'll get an additional plus 4 dodge bonus to AC against melee attacks while we are fighting defensively, which just makes us better off in melee. Then at 9, I like to pick up superior summoning, and this will cause our summoning spells to add an additional summon to whatever the dice roll was on summoning spells that give us more than one creature. Now, if you plan on using your summoning spells to only summon one creature at a time, you don't necessarily need to pick up superior summoning, because if you are only using the summoning option to summon one creature, then superior summoning won't actually do anything. So depending on how you want to use your summons, you may not necessarily need this feat, but I like it. And then we have Crane Repost. This will reduce the crane style penalty to our attack rolls even further down to just minus one to our attack rolls when fighting defensively. And whenever we lose our dodge bonus from Crane Wing because an attack missed us by four or less, the enemy provokes an attack of opportunity, which is honestly really good for us. Next up, Pummeling Style. First things first, this is not compatible with Crane Style, which is probably what people who are more familiar with the game are screaming at their monitor right now. That is absolutely correct. However, me personally, I like the gameplay of switching between Pummeling Style and Crane Style respectively when I need them. So pummeling style causes your full attacks or our flurry of blows, which is a monk thing that we get simply by having our monk. But essentially our full attacks made against a single opponent with our unarmed strikes, we will total the damage but with all of our hits before we apply their damage reduction. Now, while that's certainly not that bad, we're actually not concerned about that by itself. We're concerned with a feat we're gonna get here in a couple levels. Then at level 15, I like to pick up wings just cause that's an extra free plus three to our dodge AC. And then at 17, pick up Pummeling Charge. This is why we pick up Pummeling Style. So when we have Pummeling Style active instead of Crane Style and we make a charge, we can charge and make a full attack, much in the way an animal companion like the Smilodon can charge and make a full attack. Though for them it's an ability called Pounce, whereas for us it's Pummeling Charge. Now again, this isn't for everybody, but I like to switch between Pummeling Style and Crane Style specifically to get this full attack on the end of the charge. And then at level 19, truthfully, doesn't really matter. I like to pick up Improved Critical for Unarmed Strike, but I mean, really, you could put whatever you want there. Now, in terms of equipment, the nicest thing about this build is that you really don't need anything special. Because we're doing unarmed attacks and we're unarmored, we don't really need to worry about any weapons we find. We don't need to worry about any special armor because we won't be wearing it. So really just the best of whatever else you can find is great. So just the highest bracers of armor you can find, the highest uh, natural armor amulet you can find, and then beyond that whatever you can find to buff up your stats as much as possible, such as a headband of mental perfection or just charisma in general because we're using a ton of charisma, so the more charisma the better. This gives us more AC as well as more uses of our abilities. And then when it comes to belts, the best case scenario is a belt of physical perfection. However, there is a belt called Mangling Frenzy, which also gives you bonuses to being in rage. Specifically, uh, DR3 against everything and an additional 4 die 6 slashing damage on every critical hit while we are raging, which includes our demonic rage. Though that said, we're going to be using both and we'll get to that. But unfortunately, you won't find this belt until very late game. It's actually found in Is on one of the mini bosses there. So very late game that you'll find that belt. But beyond that, honestly, just the best equipment you can find, anything that gives you bonuses to rage and buffs up your AC and your stats as much as possible. You really can't go wrong here and that's probably the best part about the build is that it is not really super gear dependent. Now before we jump into some combat examples I want to talk mythic paths. Normally I put this at the end but this build benefits from basically one mythic path the most like much more so than the others and that is the demon mythic path. I'm not going to say it's impossible to use others but personally, I wouldn't. I would go demon all day long. Now, a bit of a trap pick here that I do want to talk about at the beginning. I think this is a bug, so I'm not going to tell people to never use it. But as a Scald, you get access to the Limitless Rage Mythic ability, which should remove the amount of times you can rage per day. However, for the Scald, 
it does not actually remove the limit on your inspired rage because I think it's actually handled as a bard song, whereas Limitless Rage only affects rage effects, which to me comes across as a bug because we shouldn't even be able to pick Limitless Rage if we can't use Rage. So again, I'm pretty sure that's a bug, but I would not actually pick Limitless Rage until that gets fixed. But beyond that, for our mythic beginnings, that is to say rank one and two, we want to go with Close to the Abyss. This is going to give us a gore attack. And then at rank two, we become closer to demons, granting us immunity to poisons, as well as resist electricity 20. And then starting at level three, which is when we actually choose our mythic choice, we want to pick up again demon. So this is going to give us demonic rage. During combat, we can enter demonic rage as a free action. It will last until the end of combat. And while we're in Demonic Rage, we gain a plus two bonus to our attack rolls, damage rolls, caster level checks, reflex saving throws, the DC for all saving throws against our spells and abilities is increased by two, and this increases 6th and ninth Mythic rank. We can normally use this three times per day, and then that increases its 6th and ninth rank. Important thing to understand about Demonic Rage is that it stacks with your Inspired Rage, which seems excessive, but I did check and it absolutely does stack, at least currently, which makes it ridiculous to use both of these. Now, beyond that, the reasons we are going to be using the Demon is that they get a lot of bonuses to natural attacks, which really complements this build a lot. So... What I want to call out specifically is Demonic Claws. This will cause us to grow claws whenever we want. They're considered primary attacks unless we're using them with a weapon. However, it's important to note that while Demonic Claws can be useful situationally, you might see this and go, oh, well, I'm using an unarmed build. Obviously, I want these Demonic Claw natural attacks. Not so much. You'll want to use them situationally but you will actually get more natural attacks by having these turned off because the monk gets bonuses to their unarmed attacks, which is not what these claws are. And the claws actually kind of negate that. So you'd actually be sacrificing up to two attacks per round late game by using demonic claws. However, if what you are fighting is like immune to bludgeoning or something, you might want to turn on demonic claws because they do slashing damage instead. So situationally, they can be useful, but most of the time you'll have demonic claws turned off because it's a toggle ability. In that rank 7, you actually get deadly natural weapons, which will cause all of our natural weapons to ignore damage reduction of demons and count as having a plus 2 enhancement bonus. And plus, all of our natural attacks will then be counted as primary. So that's actually incredible, and it's important to note that it counts towards all all of our natural weapons regardless of their source. So other mythic abilities you might want to pick up as you level up are a master shapeshifter. This is more if you're using the demon polymorph abilities they get as part of their spellbook. They can turn into various demon shapes and master shapeshifter will give you a big bonus to that if you choose to use it. But if you're not using that, obviously maybe use something else. And then brutality incarnate is a must. This will cause our natural attacks to ignore all damage reduction except just flat damage reduction. And then beyond that, uh, as you level up, you're going to pick aspects of demons that you can take on while you are using your demonic rage. Obviously focus on the ones that give you bonuses to your natural and physical attack. This is going to be things like the Shur, the Vavakia, the Rolakai. Vavakia is a personal favorite of mine because this is going to give you a big bonus to your strength score, which is just huge for this particular build. And the Mythic Charge ability can be really useful as well. Now for Mythic Feats, you're pretty much wide open, kind of whatever you want. The only one I would say is really important is Mythic Charge because when you charge, this will cause that to deal extra damage equal to 1d6 divine damage per mythic rank, which if you're charging and using the pummeling style, you'll get a lot of use out of that. And then to top it all off, our mythic summons will also benefit from our augmented summoning and everything, which is just really fun as well. But with all that said, let's talk a little bit of combat. Uh, again, combat for this primarily revolves around toggling and summoning abilities and things beforehand. So, so we will get some buffs from the Scald spell list, such as uh, Mirror Image, Displacement, Haste, etc. You're going to want to use the normal stuff there going to have that active. But in addition to that, we're going to be summoning things. You want to do that before combat because they only last so many rounds per level. But when you enter combat, you can have all of your summons up, all of your normal pre-buff stuff that you would normally have on higher difficulties, which will be, again, things like mirror image and displacement that you are personally using, which are going to make you incredibly hard to hit with your naturally high monk AC anyway. And then you're going to combine that with your inspired rage and your demonic rage. All of that stuff buffed up and working for you. You should get around 8 to 9, depending on exactly what your equipment setup is, unarmed attacks per round. And really what this getting the most out of this build is going to come down to is whether or not you are toggling all of your various abilities and your summons and things appropriately 
which again is why this honestly just isn't a build I would recommend for like complete beginners because it's a little more complicated than most of them are because every single round, and honestly, this is why I would highly recommend playing this build in turn-based, by the way, you are basically going to have to toggle several abilities or make sure that you are getting the most out of each attack by toggling various abilities and seeing what effects things have for you. But provided you're up for doing that, making sure you're using the appropriate styles, etc., you'll be able to, on average, deal about 20 to 30 damage with each individual attack, but on crits, it can easily be upwards of 100 damage per attack. So with all of the mythic abilities and everything going, it's very possible with just your character to deal over 1,000 damage a round. Obviously, it'll be less than that normally, especially towards in-game, but in-game, it's definitely going to be possible, obviously, you're going to be dealing less than that normally. But with just this class's buffs, not to say buffs that you've gotten from other sources, like other classes in your party, etc., but just from this class, your bonuses to your own attack rolls should be in like the plus 30, plus 40 range, which combined with other classes' buffs will give you more than enough attack to actually hit things, even on unfair, which is important. And that's not even going out to mention how your scald spells can affect your entire party, such as the haste or good hope, etc. Your summons that will also be affected by your inspired rage, as well as your inspired rage affecting other party members. So this is simultaneously a fantastic damage dealer on top of being a great supporter as well. But what it really comes down to more than anything is toggling things at the appropriate time, which is why this just isn't a build I would recommend for new players. It's a ton of fun. I've been having a lot of fun with it, actually. But getting the most out of it requires a lot of micromanaging, so it's probably not going to be for everybody. And truthfully, the first couple acts on Unfair are just very difficult because you don't have access to the resources you'll have later in game. But it is nonetheless very possible to use this build on Unfair. But there you go, guys. That is everything I've got for you. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you try the build, by all means, let me know what you think about it down in the comment section below. I love hearing what people think about these builds. So if you watched the video, especially this far in, thank you so much. It was a bit of a long one, but there was a lot to go over. So thank you. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.